Okay, so after much talking, it is finally time to enter the BRF Plus workbench. The workbench can be launched by entering the transaction code. Usually, every transaction or application has just one code. We don't need any more. But for BRF Plus, there are three different codes. All of them open the same workbench. You see, even in this regard, BRF Plus excels in providing us with great flexibility. Just kidding, of course. The first code exists for historical reasons. FDT underscore workbench. FDT is acronym for formula and derivation tool, which is the old name of BRF Plus. This code is just too long for me. We'll check the other two. Another valid code for launching the workbench is BRF Plus written as a single word, like this. The third option is writing BRF Plus, only this time the plus is written not as a word, but as the actual plus sign. Like this. This is my favorite one. We are finally here, the screen of BRF Plus. As I said before, when you enter a clean slate BRF, you must create an application to get started. And so, we have at the top a message reminding us that we haven't created an application yet. But before we create an application, let me explain to you about the different parts of the screen. When you start the workbench the first time, it will probably look like the screen you see right now. There is a menu bar at the top, a navigation panel on the left hand side, which is now empty because we haven't created any objects yet. And here in the middle, we have the main display and editing area. The navigation and panel has two main modes, the repository mode, which is the default, and another mode called catalog. The catalog mode is regarded as an advanced feature, but personally, I don't use it so much. I will talk about it in a later lecture. Let me just go back to the repository mode. The repository mode gives us access to all the objects in the repository. The repository supports four different views, which can be changed via this Dropbox. The default view is called My Applications. In this view, only applications that were created by me are to be shown in the navigation panel. The next view is called search result. As the name implies, in this view, we get to see only the objects that are the result of the left search. Let's do a quick demo. I will now search for all objects of the type application. For this end, I first need to click the search button. The pop-up window allows me to search according to changeable criteria. I will choose to search for objects according to their type. The type I'm interested in is application. Notice how the navigation panel automatically switches to search result view. I can then go back to my applications view. And then again, go to the search result without the need of reconducting the search. Nice feature. The favorites view allows you to maintain and access a list of favorite objects. This view is intended to keep permanent list with objects of interest. The recently used view provides access to objects that have recently been displayed or edited. This can be very useful when you work on many objects that are belong to different applications, as it saves you the time of traveling on the objects tree.
The objects shown in the navigation panel are not simple entries in a flat list, rather each object is the entry point to a hierarchy of sub-elements and usages. You can drill down through the object hierarchy by clicking on the triangle sign to the left of each object. The used or included objects are organized according to their type. The object type is reflected by an icon on the left side of each object entry. The icon on the right signifies the object status. Active objects have, for example, a green icon. Inactive objects, a gray one, and a problematic object will have a red icon. For each entry in the navigation panel, a rich context menu is provided. The menu includes, for example, entries for object creation, displaying, editing, copying, or accessing connected tools. The menu is dynamically composed based on the entry it is called on, and the complexity of the menu depends also on the user's personalization, which I will talk about in a later lecture. When you click on an object in the navigation panel, the object is shown in the main work area. The object header can be shown at the top of the object display. Here the type and name of the object are shown, followed by the current display mode and the object status. An object can always be visualized in two modes in the main area of the workbench, Edit Mode and Display Mode. In Display Mode, the object cannot be altered, but it is therefore presented in a more readable way in which rather distracting UI elements for editing are hidden. Below the header is the object toolbar. It mainly consists of a row of buttons. The back button on the left hand side allows for navigation to a previously displayed object. The next button toggles between display and change mode. The rest of the buttons trigger different actions for the currently displayed object. Many of these actions can also be accessed via the context menu in the navigation panel. The rest of the screen is occupied by the actual object editor. It always consists of two parts. The general section contains a set of attributes common to all objects in BRF+, whereas the detail section is specific to the current object type. I will now elaborate a bit more about the general section. All the objects in BRF have a certain set of general properties and attributes in common. The term attributes refers to non-changeable properties. Their values are automatically calculated by the system. Some properties might get a default value, but can be changed. By default, the general section is minimized, so the main work area is bigger and less noisy. Clicking on the expand button will expose the view of the section, which is organized by individual tabs. The generally non-changeable properties are displayed under the general tab. I will explain each one of them. ID, a generated universally unique identifier for the object. Created by contains the name of the user that has created the object. Created on contains the date the object was created. Changed by contains the name of the user that last changed the object. Changed on contains the date and the time the object was last changed. The storage type signifies whether this particular object is local or transportable. And of course, we have the name of the object. Names have a special meaning in the creation of an object. Giving the object a name implicitly means the object can be reused by other objects and has a life cycle of its own. 
There are some restrictions on object naming. One of them is that the name must start with a letter of the alphabet or a slash. If you try to give a name that violates one of the restrictions, you will get a relevant error message. In general, names do not have to be unique. This is because the ID we saw earlier. Every object has a unique string of characters that identifies it. This works much like a social security number with persons. However, there are two exceptions. Application names must be unique and also functions within the same application must have unique names within their application. No need to say that using different names makes it easier to distinguish between objects, especially if they are of the same type. Now, what's that versioning field? For all BRF objects, versioning can individually be switched on or off, so this field indicates that status. Versioning allows you to track changes and to run older versions of an object in a given point in time. But I will get to that later. Let's move on to the text tab. As I already mentioned, objects have names, but it is good practice to also provide them with long and short texts to represent them in the user interface. The formal name should be a technical name, while the text fields should be more intuitive to a casual user. The text fields may be stored in a language-dependent way. The drop-down list makes it possible to display or change the texts for all available languages. Also, if versioning is turned on, we can choose a combination of a language version dependency. I recommend the language dependent but not version dependent option, as it is pointless to store the same texts multiple times for each version. The settings for documentation are similar to text settings. You can access them on the separate tab documentation. As for text, documentation can be defined via free text input. This type of documentation allows the entry of a simple, unformatted string of any length that can assist in providing useful information about the object. Let's go back to the general tab. There is one field I haven't talked about yet, the access level. What is this access level? Well, named objects can be referenced and thereby reused by other objects. However, if a reused object needs to be changed, this may affect and require modification of all using objects. Also, a used object cannot be deleted unless all using objects are deleted as well, or the usages have been removed. With the access level setting, BRF Plus allows you to restrict the usage of an object to objects of a specific domain only. The domains are defined by different access levels. They depend mainly on application component, which can be defined in this field. Application components are structured in hierarchy. The hierarchy levels are separated by a dash. Let's review the different options. The application option is the default setting. This option makes the object accessible only for objects of the same application. The application component option makes the object accessible only for objects of the same application component. The superordinate component option makes the object accessible only for objects that share the same superior application component. The top component option makes the object accessible only for objects that share the same top application component. 
the global option makes the object accessible for all objects without restrictions. As a rule of thumb, an object should always have as little accessibility as possible, but as much accessibility as needed. By default, the most restrictive access level is used. For objects that may already be productively used, the access level should never be reduced because dependent objects could become inconsistent because of that change. To make things simpler, I like using only the extreme ends of the spectrum, meaning the application option and the global option. Notice that those options don't require an application component definition. If you organize your object with care in suitable different applications, then you won't need to bother yourself with application component definitions.